in the next minute or so. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. It's seven o'clock. You know what that means. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for coming along this evening. This is the annual meeting of Froome Town Council. I'm Sarah Butler, and I will be chairing for the first item on the agenda, which is when we will elect the incoming mayor. Uh, just to remind everybody, there are people in the room, obviously, you can see that. There are also people online. Um, for everyone in the room, with some housekeeping. If a fire alarm goes off, the emergency exit is over there in the corner of the room and the assembly point is at the far side of the car park. Uh, the upstairs toilet is being decorated at the moment, but there's an accessible um, toilet just outside by the lift. And if you need it, there's a, a, another toilet downstairs. Help yourself to tea, coffee and refreshments over there. Tonight, Paul here is clerking. Sarah and Rachel will manage the minutes uh, and the question board and the participant settings and the IT. The meeting is recorded and we will be being live streamed to our YouTube channel. Um, for those councillors attending on Zoom, please use your yellow hands uh, for questions and everyone else use your real hands for questions. Um, I've just got one job this evening, but before I do that, I've got one very small presentation that I would like to make. And honestly, this job is impossible without Laura. So Phil, you treasure, you treasure her. She is an absolute marvel. So this is for her. Big, big thank you and a huge thank you to all of you as well. It's been an amazing year and I hope I've done you proud. My last job this evening then is to ask if anyone would like to propose, you don't have to, but if anyone would like to propose Philip Campagna as the new mayor, Nick Dove, and can I have a seconder? Steve Tanner. Uh, and on that note, it's now my job to hand over to, oh, oh, uh, can everyone else vote on that? Uh, where's my card? I'm safe, I'm safe. I'm kidding, obviously. My card's over there and that's a yes. <laughs> yes, thank you, Lisa. That's, that's You're in. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm just going to say three thank yous. The three thank yous are to my 89-year-old Sicilian mum, who wanted to be here tonight, thought it was going to be some great ceremony. Unfortunately, it's not, but thank you, mama. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I'd like to thank Sarah. Um, we had loads of meetings during the year, and she's been absolutely great. And I remember watching uh, last year, as I was proposed, she was proposing me as uh, deputy mayor, I was in a hotel room in Belfast, don't ask any questions. And I was then, uh, as I was listening, I heard her say, and you've got the junior seat. And now I know what she means. This is the, the big seat. And as, as Sarah returns, I say to the sort of back benches, um, to say that she uh, will be and continue to be an absolutely fantastic councillor. And, and I've enjoyed every minute. And I hope I can bring as much glitter, probably not, as you, as, as, as you have, absolutely fantastic. And the third thank you is to Kari, my wife, and my two daughters, just to say thanks a lot for support. Yeah. Didn't even leave it on the right page. Okay. So my first action of the evening is to propose uh, Deputy Mayor, and I'd like to propose Andy Jones. Is there a seconder? Fiona? And all those in favour? 
Thank you. Is that unanimous? So, that's, that's unanimous. Thanks, Andy. Okay, so second item on the agenda, apologies for absence, if we've received any. No, we haven't. Okay, thank you, that was good. And the next part is declarations of, declarations of councillor interests. Do we have any tonight's meeting? Nope. And then moving on to the approval of the minutes from the last meeting on the 19th of April, 2023. Can I make a change to the minutes? Clarify something in the minutes? Are you sorry? There's something in the minutes that isn't quite right. Uh, it's to do with something I said. Okay, if, if, if we go through, there's a couple of updates. Okay. Sorry. There's, there's a couple of updates that people want to give on, on number two. Is it before number two or afterwards? Fiona. It's to do with the minutes. Oh, the number. The... Oh, the number. It's five. Oh, yeah. So, so we, yeah. we do a little update first and then get to that. And then we can go through to the end. So, I think, uh, Philip, the um, Peter Wheelhouse wanted a, Is Peter online? Yeah. So, Peter Wheelhouse just wanted an update on the crossing, Jill, that you raised last time. So, over to you, Peter. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so after the last council meeting, I contacted the uh, highway traffic engineer for Froome, and they put me in touch with the traffic control team at Somerset Council uh, to answer the queries that have been raised. Uh, the first thing to, to say is that the crossing that, that uh, was talked about last time is the crossing uh, mm. between Iceland and Scott Road. Uh, and this is a new style crossing, uh, which is a, a national standard replacement for the old style Pelican crossings, uh, just so you're clear on that. So it's a new style. Um, the first question that was raised was about the timings, the amount of time that pedestrians had to cross. And the people that I spoke with at the traffic control team said that the pedestrian crossing timings have been checked. They are within national standards, um, but they highlighted that there is a second line uh, protector of pedestrian safety as people cross. So the normal thing is, is um, the green pedestrian signal comes up and that's an invitation for people to cross the road. Uh, once the, the green signal disappears, there are actually above ground detectors uh, which monitor pedestrian movements and they will actually hold uh, motorists on red until pedestrians have finished crossing the road. So there are a couple of things there that that actually are designed to protect people crossing the road. So that was the first issue that was raised. The second one was about the the, the fact that these new style crossings don't have an audible beeper. Uh, and it, it was explained to me that that's been removed uh, mainly from a safety point of view because it prevents pedestrians from relying on the beeper and encourages them to look in the direction of oncoming traffic and to ensure that all vehicles have actually stopped on their red. Um, and the other thing to, to note is that the, the push button units uh, at this particular site benefit from what are known as rotating tactile cones. Now they're specially for the visually impaired and they're recommended by the Royal National Institute for the Blind. So the cones are actually found on the underside of the push button control box, and they rotate when the green pedestrian symbol appears and it's safe to cross. The cone has ridges in it, so it can be easily felt by somebody who is visually impaired. And a tactile indicator helps deaf blind people as well. And of course they can't hear audible signals. So that's another additional safety feature, which is designed with the visually impaired and deafblind people in mind. 
And I think the last point that was raised at the council meeting was about the, the lack now on the, the new star signals of a far-sided red and green pedestrian sig signal display. So typically on the old style crossings, you used to look up and see the, uh, the green signal, or the red signal come up to tell you whether it was safe to cross. Now those have been replaced now with nearsighted displays and, uh, and apparently this encourages pedestrians to look in the direction of oncoming traffic. And actually due to the high pedestrian flows at this site, the council, uh, Somerset Council has added uh, higher level repeater displays. So if you've got a queue of people waiting to cross at that crossing, everyone should be able to, to see when it's safe to cross. So those were the uh, responses that, that were given. And I, I just thought it was helpful for councillors and others to know what Somerset Council said. Thanks very much, Peter. Jill, uh, there's a point you raised. Yeah, any, anything you'd like to say, comment? No, this morning I attended the uh, Macula Group in Froome and we had the regional director for the Macula Society and this question was brought up in the fact that these the um, visually impaired people have not been fully informed of the process of these new traffic lights and they are they are nationwide this transformation of traffic light system and so if the blind people are not being properly informed which i think they should be and i think we should all be properly informed as to the um the, the timing the timing of the of the green man and i fully understand because i have step i have um, stood and watched while the green man goes out and the traffic is still stationary so it obviously does give time for any disabled people or anybody with, who, with a mobility problem to get across while they are on the crossing but you know, people need to know about this new system of lights. Nothing has been put in the paper as regarding the the system of of the well of the whatever. You know, I can't think of the word at the moment. But um, you know, the routine of things and this, this particular cone. A lot of the blind people do not know that there is a cone underneath that they need to hold. How is it that they don't know? Anyway, I haven't, um, uh, this was brought to their attention. And as you say, the RNIB have approved of this system anyway. So anyway, I have nothing more to say. Okay, thank you, Jill. I think Peter would like to respond. Um, I think obviously one of the things we could do is we could put some information on our website uh, and circulate the information through other means. We'll, we'll have a look at that after the meeting one thing that is worth mentioning though is that the rotating tactile cones have been on these uh, push button units for a long time now that they're not a, a specific feature of the new style of crossings they've actually been in existence since the mid 90s but of course not everyone is necessarily aware of them and we'll have a look at how we can disseminate that information uh, across the community Right. Thank you, Peter. Is that okay, Jill? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa. Hello. Hi. Hi, Jill. Um, I'm just uh, really interested in, in, in what you're saying, and I think you're right that we could disseminate the information a little bit a little bit more broadly. I'm wondering if you'd be happy to, to, to work with some of us on putting an article together for the Froome Times. And I think it would be really nice if, if, if I'm quite strongly about this, because I've dealt a lot with over the years with blind and partially sighted people. And it's important that they have a safety crossing, at least. I mean, that is the main crossing point in the Froome town. I absolutely agree. So so if if I could get in touch with you after the meeting and, and when we can yeah. put together an yes. article. Yeah, I'm happy about that. Great. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Lisa. Anyone else on that? Okay, um, there's a point in the minutes, uh, Nick, I think, might want to say something about ID Verdi and, and Town Centre and so on. Yeah, thanks very much. Actually, the action is shown to RB, which I think it should be RH. Um, and I know Rob has um, picked this up and has done some work, but we are meeting with uh, Paul, I think, and um, others with ID Verdi, 
Martin Dimery and um, somebody who was at Mendip is now at Somerset with a similar role um, on the something like the 6th of June. I think Rob is online, so he might be able to give more detail on that. Uh, yep. Hi. Can can everyone hear me? Yep. yep. Uh, yes. So I followed up on uh, the question from from last month. Um, it was um, partly it was about uh, how much money is the contract for ID Verdi and Froome. Um, I did uh, raise that with um, neighbourhood services in Mendip, as was uh, Somerset County, as is, and uh, they 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 weren't able as as we have been told in the, in the past we they weren't able to tell us how much the exclusively Froome elements was the they pointed us in the direction of the contracts register and the only information available on that on there is the value for the whole of the id verdi contract for the mendip area which which is for 40 40.6 million uh that's over 10 years and that includes their um um maintenance of, of of ground spaces as well as the cleaning and litter so um we haven't we haven't managed to get any more specific information on that but as 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 nick says on the it's at the, the first of june we're going to meet with neighborhood services martin dimery councillor martin dimery is going to join us and we're going to have a look at the uh the 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 service in the town to to have a look at whether there's any um breaches or or any differences of view about uh, the standards, or and whether they're meeting their um, their service standards uh, for for what's required, and um, and so yeah, we'll have a chance to look at that, and also the the question that that Mar Martin Dimery raised of service devolution and that being one of the principles underlying the merger of the two councils and if there was to be service devolution and if Froome Town Council is particularly capable and keen to, to explore that is that is that is that a, a topic worthy of exploring further so I think I think that will be a useful meeting on the 1st of June and, and maybe we can report back at the the next meeting on the results of that okay thanks Rob Nick is okay yep thank you very much uh Fiona um, yeah, just on five, I just wanted to correct something that was in the minute. It says Fiona Bowles was not convinced this committee was the answer to the need for accountability. It was the advisory groups that I wasn't convinced by. I actually fully support the committee. So I just wanted to. Um, on number five, uh, item five, uh, it just says Fiona Bowles was not convinced this committee was the answer to the need for accountability. If it could just be changed, Fiona Bowles was not convinced this, the, uh, these oversight committees are the, need, are the answer. Do you, not sorry, advisory groups. I'm getting confused now. Whatever they're called, the advi the other ones, advisory panels, advisory groups, whatever they are called. We can just just delete that. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we'll delete that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. So now we need to approve the minutes. Someone to propose. Yes, somebody to propose, please. Sarah. Sara, uh, Ben, second. All those in favour? I was attending on Zoom. So. Okay, okay. So, so that's majority. And I'll put you as abstaining, Andy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, item three on the agenda questions and comments from the public and councillors and Somerset councillors, if we take questions and comments from the public first, please. Yes, it is Ian. I just wanted to say hello. Um, my name is Ian, Ian Smith. I'm vicar of Quakerton Church. And we've been here since September. And um, I just wanted to say hello to everybody and say, so far, we love being in Froome. And it's a great place to be. Fantastic that there's a town council like this that really cares for the town. So I look forward to getting to know you more. Thank you, Ian. You are most welcome. I've, I've met Ian previously, but you're, you're most welcome and to Froome and to this meeting. Any comments from councillors? Mel. Uh, I really 
appreciate the um, information that's been given to us by the new Somerset Council members. I've learned more in the last few weeks than I have done in 10 years before that. Uh, so that's good, that's a step forward. It would be great if the three councillors could, could get together I'm getting all sorts of signs from over there. It'd be great if the if the uh, if the councillors could get together sometime in the near future when you know you sorted out your own political differences uh, and actually produced one report because there's quite a lot of um, repetition uh, and it would show incredible willing on your part if that was if that was done. So uh, I'm, I'm not expecting it next next time round, but sometime in the future it would be great. And we don't really need references to. Um, uh, you know, my co my green colleague who's worked hard at this, or my Lib Dem co colleague, that's not really relevant to us, but thank you very much for what you've done so far. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. Helen. Kay. Helen Kay, yes. Um, I haven't provided a written report. I don't know if you want a verbal report from me now or not. Yeah, it's okay. Well, I don't know if it's repetitious. I hope not. Um, do you want two minute report? Two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've just changed my glasses. I'm trying to take ten seconds. <laughs> um, so um, I don't know how far back you want me to go. So just looking from the start of the new year, when it was we were still Mendip and Somerset County councillors, um, we've approved a green spaces um, supplementary planning document. And um, as I think you know, before that, we approved a supplementary planning document um, for to to beef up more sustainable design and energy efficiency um, for developments coming forward. And I was the main driver for that. Um, I've also been on it was on the uh, climate and ecological emergency group and was um, sort of driving and monitoring the tree strategy, which has now gone to Somerset County Council. It's going to be a, a county wide tree strategy. Um, as um, I'm in the area of Froome that's taking the most planning applications, the large estates, I'm still tracking all of those on FR2, FR3, as they're called in the local plan. Um, last year, I was on the Constitution and Governance Committee, um, and I that was for Somerset County Council, where we looked at how we were going to deal. I was particularly interested in planning applications applications and worked alongside um, a lot of um, other interested councillors to make sure that um, at least the large uh, estates were not being decided in Taunton but were going to be decided in the equivalent of Mendip. Um, that's going to be looked at again in October so it does need to be tweaked. Um, I've been to a about, I used to go to quite a lot of the planning advisory group meetings of Froome Town Council, now called the Planning Committee, but that's dropped off a bit. I'm still going to about half of those, about half the LGR meetings, half the LCN meetings. I've been going to about half the executive meetings of the Somerset New Somerset Council and keeping an eye on what they're doing. I'm particularly proud of the fact that they put together a council plan. This is the new council plan for Somerset Count, uh, for the new unitary authority. And it had four visions in here. One of them was called a green and more sustainable um, Somerset and actually in my view was written really badly by the economic development team and I've kept at Bill Revens and um, several others to change it and they've finally they accepted almost all my amendments so that's written much better now that's important because this vision will determine the business plan and there'll be a whole load of high level key performance indicators that will come out of this and these will be tracked for the next four years and these are the those business um, that business plan will be what they put the money into at Somerset County. So it's quite important to have to have a good business plan. So they're probably developing that now. Um, um, with regards to the new local plan going forward, I keep asking, but I haven't had any answers yet on who's going to actually be doing that. Under the Local Government Act 2000, I'm sorry, I'm nearly finished, right? Under the Local Government Act 2000, the Somerset Council, the new Somerset Council had a choice that either that would be a committee of the council or it would be a subcommittee of the executive. They've chosen to go for a subcommittee of the executive, which means that Bill Revens appoints people onto that committee. Right. So I'm really keen to make sure that we have a cross section of people on that committee across the whole of Somerset, across all the different political parties and failing that, that we have a scrutiny group that 
that scrutinizes that subcommittee work again it has a cross section of people on it so that um we are not left behind in in Froome. um i've also i don't want to go through all the de other details but broadly speaking my co-ward councillor here shane is not here tonight so in terms of where you might want to direct your inquiries um at the moment, the way we split up our old Keyford Mendit ward is that I did sort of the higher areas around the Mount and the new estates going out of town. And he dealt with the station and Edmund Park and Vic the Victoria Road area. Um, Could I ask you then perhaps I'll meet with you later and we'll okay I'll, I'll wrap up it's just that just I'll just quickly say that going forward it's likely that I'm going to that's going to continue on and I'm going to deal with the cell the Selwood parish area going out of town and any inquiries around the Berkeley down area should go to, to Shane please all right thank you um, and I believe Andy would like to come back on something yeah, just, just wanted to come back quickly um, and you probably won't be surprised to hear this but um, at the last planning committee, we tripped over the fact that the new rules from Somerset insist that as a, a consultee from town council either has to object or support every planning application. That's removed our ability to make constructive comments without being uh, one side or the other of the fence. And I really think that needs review. I'll just quickly say that um, I made a lot of men amendments to the original constitution that was put forward and most of them were, cha were changed but when it got to that point I think it was a step too far and some of my amendments started to fail but we're going to have a review in October and I'll bring that up again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Andy. Um, we've got some uh, questions online. We've got Dawn Denton. Got a hand up. Hi Dawn. Hello. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick little update from things that were uh, mentioned last week. So um, Fiona just asked about the the finance, and I've done a very brief um, report back in the handwritten report. But it's just that the 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 outturn or end of year report is due at the end of May, and at the moment the administration will probably draw on reserves to balance the books. But sometimes the business rates income is more than predicted and that could give some extra funding towards the end of the year but i will make a full report as soon as that comes out and then the other thing adam and i met with um, the leisure center about the parking um, a member of the public asked about that parking area um last month there are no plans for a pay and display unit to be installed there but there are ongoing conversations and um, which adam probably can report back a little bit better on that um, in relation to money that uh, the school paid out in the upkeep of the parking area. So I think there's conversations between the three organizations, the Leisure Centre, the Merlin and Somerset Council. And then the last one is a very successful um, launch to the Flex Plastic, um, the Flex Collect um, pilot that's running in Froome, mostly in Froome North, um, where 3,600 houses are going to be um, collecting their soft plas plastics, the stuff that actually fills your bin at the moment if you're recycling effectively. And they had two pop-ups, one at St. Mary's and one at um, the Cricket Club this past week. And actually it's been um, really successful. The public have come in to ask questions about what can go into their bags and um, all the information is available online, but also people can order more bags if they want to. And if this is a success, which I think it will be, it will be rolled out um, Firstly, I suppose, in Somerset and then across the country, although there are pilots happening in other parts of the, count of the country. But what's really lovely about this trial, actually, is that it's being funded by the big supermarkets. So this will hopefully also give them an incentive just to consider the kind of, um, you know, packaging that they're already putting into place. So um, there you go. Great. Thanks, Dawn. Thanks very much. And um, we have another hand up. This is uh, Mike Dunk. Hi, Mike. Thank you. Um, so I'll just turn up. Yeah, we are. Um, hi there. Uh, I'll keep it um, short because um, really, for me, um, the, nothing much has happened on the committees I'm on. I'm on strategic planning and um, the pensions committee. And so uh, I think um, we had one strategic planning meeting. But um, really, it looks like because a lot of the decisions are going to be in the hands of the local planning boards, um, I think we're trying to look at what we're actually going to do. Uh, if it's just footpaths, 
um, and not a lot else, then it um, we might have a very quiet time of it. But we'll, we'll see. Uh, but that's that's sort of um, bubbling away in the background. Um, and so far, I, I, you know, it's difficult to see what we're going to be getting uh, through. Um, the pensions committee, I'm, I'm trying to see if we can get a, a better engagement with um, the people who pay in um, the stakeholders of the pension. Um, I don't think we do any communications um, at the moment. And I think because I hold a Baines pension, because um, I worked in a school for four years, I get their lovely newsletter that tells me what they're doing. And at least I feel that I get some feedback from where my money's going. Um, and, you know, I'll be trying to look at what portfolios they're choosing. And luckily, um, we already got two people from Froome Town Council involved in uh, Anne Hills and I um, can't remember the name of the other uh, lady, but... Um, Anyway, we are, we've got Froome Town Council representation, which is great. So I hope we can get some input going there um, so that we get what we want with our pensions. Um, the Climate, Place and Scrutiny Committee, which Martin chairs, um, today there were actually five Green councillors, four from Froome and Mart uh, Dave Mansell, um, on the um, either virtually attending or on the committee. And I think that's going to be where... As Green councillors, we're going to be trying to um, hold them to account, if you like, hold the Lib Dems to account and make sure that what is actually happening, um, you know, whether we know what's going on and we're getting to grips with the climate change uh, agenda. So that's that. Um, very interesting um, briefing. Are we, are we, are we, are we nearly, finished? Are we nearly finished? Yeah. Local nature recovery strategy, which is very interesting. And I want to keep an eye on that. It, it will impact potentially on uh, eventually on planning applications uh, if it if it's ex successful in that area. Um, and I and you don't really want to know about hey, Mike, uh, we... casework, but um, I'm keeping um, keeping up with the casework I still have from Mendit. Um, and well Thanks done, Dawn, for briefing us on the flex plastic. I was quite envious of the people who've got that. I ha I'd love to be in that trial. Um, so I'm very sad that I'm not. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. Mel, yes, I'm, I, 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 I'm trying to give everybody a fair, fair go. And I, I, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, but you, we've just seen perfect examples of what I was trying to avoid in the future. Uh, things that have been written down, have been repeated. It's almost like a pissing competition uh, in terms of how many Green councillors, how many Lib Dem councillors. We do not want to hear that. We don't want to hear necessarily what individual councillors are doing. What we want to hear is what the county, where the county council is moving and what is, what's been agreed by them. So I think we should issue some guidance to, 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 to these new councillors in terms of what it is that they should do, when they should submit, should, should submit written reports by, and we should just accept them. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Yeah, I think that, that is a suggestion to have, and I think that's a discussion we might need to have. Thank you for your comments. Nick, and then Sarah. No, sorry, Nick and then. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I, it's very helpful to have information, but I, if I can just say in 2012, I moved to Froome, and I was lucky enough to be in a position to build a house, and I built a house with underfloor heating, air source heat pump, and solar PV on the roof. Ten years later, I moved and I bought a house in Froome, they had a gas boiler, no solar PV. This has been under um, the current councillor, some of the current district and now unitary councillors remit, if you like. So, in, you know, it's great to move forward and so on, but let's reflect on what's really been, you know, in a school report term, pretty lamentable and pretty poor performance. Helen, do you want to come back on that, obviously? Yeah, I'm sorry. I've worked really hard with Freem Town Council for the past four years. Steve Tanner will know, and the Civic Society, to make sure that all those new developments on the edge of Froom, 500 houses, almost all of them are going to have solar panels. More than half of them are going to have air source heat pumps. It is not a requirement in our local plan. We've done it through cajoling, pressure, 
being nice about it, deferring applications and getting them to come back, saying this just isn't good enough. Even We couldn't refuse them on that basis. So we, I think we've done really well, actually. And all the ones on, I think the ones that wanted the houses that you live in, um, down the Acorn houses, um, down on uh, the print works, we pushed also for best, better insulation standards, triple glazing, and to already have all the wires uh, put in so that solar could go on top very easily and that is an achievement that is an achievement of some of the councillors at Mendip and the, this town council the previous councillors in this town council thank you thank you Helen Yana um, yes um, I was up at North Parade car park um, looking at it because of the development there I think it's in Foom North am I right um, I spoke to the parking officer and had a more interesting conversation than I thought I would have about parking in Foom. Um, and first of all, that meeting, parking meter, has been broken for about 18 months, he said, and it just hasn't been fixed. So I was wondering whether, Adam, looking directly at you, whether you'd be able to have a look at that. Um, and he also said that there is um, a prevalent issue with lines and signs, the technical term that he called it, around Foom in terms of them not being like, um, basically he cannot enforce if there is a break in the line and double yellow line. I didn't know that or a break in any of the lines. And apparently there are a lot of them are in quite bad condition and it's making his job quite hard. And I think that the council is probably losing out on money because of it, because he can't enforce. And given the 24 million pounds debt won't probably get that far but you know i just thought i would raise and i said that i would raise it on his behalf if you could have a look into it okay thank you fiona i i, I think we've given that quite an airing and um covered a lot of points there so i'm going to move on to item four um to raise the profile of aggressive begging in the town and i understand that mel is presenting on that Adam, thank you. I mean, you've provided a very long report. Unless it's very, very brief, I, I'd just like to move on, if we may, please. Oh, well, you, you never know what I'm going to say, do you? So, <laughs> I'm not going to read my report or repeat what was what has been said by anyone else. But there's a climate and place scrutiny this morning at Somerset Council. One, of, there were several items: phosphates, electric vehicle strategy, another one, and the responsiveness of the highways department. That might be interesting to you because that's going to be subject to a task and finish group, a formal group of the council because to try and improve it because uh, members of the public and other count, parish councils, uh, Somerset councils have had issues now and then with the, the slow responsiveness of the highways, highways team. So that's going to be improved. So the direction that the council's going to, is to find a problem six weeks in and then really try and address it rather than just let it lie and let it, let it drift like it maybe has done before. Um, I'm dealing with uh, fly nuisance around the sewage works again and train noise at night there. So if anyone has any insights or, or issues there that they want, to, they want to talk about, let me know, please. Today was deadline day for North Parade planning application for 18 dwellings. If you want to submit them, comments, there's only two, I think, please do so. Uh, there's full council next week, annual reports, lots of reports from the leader. The, the, the report on redundancies from the council uh, and about the savings as well, which will be uh, coming okay, our way. I really need to move on, if I may. Uh, we uh, have a very long. We're, we're also going to talk to Wessex Water sometime for the first time in public, probably for years. So, if you want to talk to uh, about that, come and see me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Adam. Mel. I better keep this short, having uh, said what I've said previously. Uh, we received a, a, a petition signed by uh, 51 stakeholders in the town from uh, two um, sh shopkeepers uh, and from Catherine Hill, who are here this evening, if anybody uh, wants to speak to them, uh, about aggressive begging. Uh, I guess most of us are not against begging necessarily, but there have been reports um, in town uh, from many people uh, to the police and from this council about a small number of people who have <clears throat> actually been very rude very difficult to, to others who are just going about their normal business in town uh, that's bad for the individuals and bad for the image of the town uh, the police have asked me to read out uh, uh, what they're doing 
but perhaps I won't actually, in view of what's happened <laughs> in the last few minutes. They basically are aware of it, that they know what they need to do, they just want more evidence. So what we're hoping for is, and I can see the Food Times is here, is more publicity. If it happens to you individually in the, in the town, make sure you report it to the police on their website, which I have used previously, and it does work. Uh, because the more evidence they have, the more uh, resources they can put into it. Uh, and they're very keen to stop uh, this kind of thing happening in, in town. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Question. Yeah. Carla? Can you define aggressive begging? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it's all, it all depends upon, it all, yeah, no. it all depends upon the incident. Elderly people being approached for money and threatened that they'll be hit if they don't hand over money. Spat on if they don't hand over money. That's what we call aggressive begging. These people involved have been offered by various organisations help. They've declined it. They choose this way of life. It is pulling the town down. We have customers coming in our shop saying, we've just had an awful experience in the car park. I said, report it to the police. Every time somebody tells me something in my shop, I say, report it to the police. The more information they've got, they can do more to stop this. This is a lovely town room, and just a few individuals are really giving it a bad name and pulling it down and it needs to be stopped. Thank you very much. Okay, any other comments? Thank you, Mel. Okay, uh, item number five on the agenda, deciding whether to adopt the council standing orders, council's code of conduct. Sorry. I'll try again. Item five. Declining whether to adopt the council standing orders, council's code of conduct, and whether to adopt the power of general competence. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my first council meeting as a chair. And yes, um, I might not be as sharp as you'd like me to be, or I might not be on the ball as you'd like me to be, but I do ask for your patience and for your tolerance, um, as I do yours. Uh, in, in, in return. So I would appreciate that um, we give courtesy to each other uh, and to the chair, uh, and also that, that we keep things civil and that we listen to each other, if that's okay. So I'll hand over to Paul, if I may, please. Thanks, Philip. Um, this item on the agenda sort of sets the rules for the civic year ahead. Standing orders, the general power of competence, and the councillor's code of conduct. Um, the, 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 the standing orders uh, look different, but aren't. They're just the model ones updated by NALC. Uh, one change that, that the model ones include is, is a kind of time limit on council meetings, which I thought was actually a really good idea, especially this evening. Um, uh, I, I've, it, it is suggested in the model ones at two and a half hours. I mean, we always try to make sure that these meetings don't go on for more than two. So I, I've, I've inserted that as a suggestion uh, as, as part of the standing orders um, and then at, at the discretion of the chair thereafter. Those are the standing orders. Um, I, I suggest I just rattle through this and we just do the, all the recommendations at the end. General power of competence, I can confirm that this council is eligible to use the power of general competence. And you'll all be familiar with the councillor's code of conduct that remains unchanged. Uh, I just recommend that you um, read them again to refresh yourself, particularly about declaring interest, because uh, I have to read them every time anyone asks me. So it's, it's, it's important that you, you're just aware of them. There are four recommendations, Laura, that could be on the screen, hopefully. Any questions? Andy. Uh, I think that's the wrong slide, Laura, but um, just while you're finding the right slide, uh, just a couple of things under 
standing orders. One is um, there's a duplication that I've discussed with Paul. Uh, there's two different lines describing what the start time of the meeting should be. I think one of them's redundant, so we should remove it. Um, I also read through the document in some detail and then did a search for either the word Zoom or the word hybrid. And there's nothing in there that describes our rules around hybrid meetings. I know those are decided by powers above our pay grade, but I think it'd be helpful just to explain those as part of standing orders. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's a good idea, Andy. Can, can I suggest that uh, if you think as a group that the standing orders are okay, I come back to a future council meeting with just a slight addition on that line? Yeah, perfectly happy with that. Thanks, Andy. Any other comments? Okay, so the recommendations as they stand, all five uh, propose. Anita, second, Lisa, can you vote please? It says no Belgian guidance at. <laughs> yeah. At a really important place on the website that we should confirm. <laughs> uh, did anyone vote against? Or abstain, so that's unanimous. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Item six, adopt the calendar for the meetings of 23-24. Any comments on that, Fiona? Um, I just wanted to say, and I'll wrap it up with something I was going to say about the thing is, I really appreciate that there aren't any back-to-back -back meetings, Laura. I imagine that's down to you. Thank you very much. That does make a big difference. And also, I really appreciated the bolding in the standing orders, coming back to that, of what is necessary and what isn't. So I just want to say thank you on both of those things. Thanks, Fiona. Any other comments? Okay. So propose. Fiona seconded Ben. Okay, Item seven, uh, appointing leader and deputy leader of the council and membership chair of the planning committee. Um, I'd like to propose Lisa Merriweather for council leader, seconded by Anita. All in favour? Yes, And Lisa, I believe you may have some proposals. Yes, firstly, uh, thank you very much to everyone. And as is customary, I'd like to thank my husband for his support in allowing me to ascend to this role. Um, that's not true. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to make some proposals for my deputies. I'd like to propose Steve Tanner and Max Wide as my deputies who will work with me on both internal and external matters in the council. The proposals are Steve Tanner and Max Wide, proposed by Lisa, seconded by Nick. I think that's, that's unanimous. Congratulations. Congratulations, Lisa, Steve, and Max. Thank you. Item, oh, sorry, no, we're on planning committee still. Um, membership and chair of planning committee. I think the names are up. Yeah, what, what, um, what I think might be wise is, is if, if, if we have the proposals to the membership of the committee, and, and then uh, we'll have a second proposal for the chair, and then I think we'll have a, sec a third proposal for the deputy. Okay. <laughs> Do you want them individually or? Yeah. So, yep. so do we have a proposal for the names of the membership of the committee up there? Steve, proposing, yes? Seconded, Mark? So that's, that's unanimous as the members of that committee. Now the sec someone needs to propose a chair. Mark proposing Steve Tanner, seconded. 
Fiona. That's unanimous. Thank you. And uh, oh, sorry, I'd like to propose um, Polly Lamb as the deputy to the chair. Proposed by Steve, seconded by Sarah. is unanimous, unanimous. Again. thank you item eight uh, appointing the membership and chair of the oversight committee lead councillors and advisory groups and i'll hand over to paul if i may thanks for it although i wasn't able to attend the, the last council meeting i know you had a really good run around on all of this so i'll i'll not try and explain again uh, the, the role of, of, of the, these three things um, but as you've just approved standing orders, as you will have read in standing orders, the remit of these three groups, the oversight committee, the advisory uh, groups, and, and, and the lead councillors, the third one, uh, have all now been agreed. So I just repeated it there just just because um, it just looks beautiful, doesn't it? Um, the frequency of the meetings, similarly for the oversight committee, you've just agreed in the calendar of meetings. So really, uh, the, 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 over the, on the oversight committee, the, the thing you need to do is just to appoint the members of that committee and, and, the, and the chair of that committee, as you just had done for the planning committee. However, I understand that, given that this has come up rather fast, that I'm not sure that councillors have a group in mind. Is that correct? I'd like to propose that all of the councillors are members of the Oversight Committee. And a second for that. Okay, do we have a seconder? Yeah. Nice. All those? Unanimous. And Lisa. Uh, can I propose Mark Dorrington as Chair of the Oversight Committee, please? A seconder, Nick. <laughs> All those in favour? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mark's the last one that didn't step back. <laughs> Great. Um, the the lead councillors again. Uh, the, the, these these. Uh, uh, I hope that you're all familiar with these lead councillors. Um, the table. Of, uh, on the screen is, is, is the proposal that I understand you want to move forward with. The, you, you'll see um, the, the last one, it's not that Kate Hallard hasn't got any friends, uh, it, it's just that we, we, we couldn't come up with an answer by the time we published the agenda. So if you have an answer for that, it could be inserted or if not to be confirmed at a later date. But that is the proposal as far as I know. For, for, for the lead councillors for each manager listed on the left hand side there and the recommendation is laura what, what is said in the table yeah. opposed sarah seconded mark All those in favor. that's unanimous and finally the the, the really big complicated table that, that I, I'm, I'm sure you'll think is, is uh, as I do, is a work in progress, uh, but, but I, I try to capture what I understood to be the case at the moment. Uh, although I know Philip uh, wants to be on the unitary group, the football club group, and the planning and affordable housing group as well. So the suggestion is that, that we, we add Philip's name to those three boxes. Uh, are there any others? That, any other changes there? Carla? Um, I would like to remove myself from the climate emergency group and join the unitary deal group. <laughs> you say that now. And are you going to so talk about the, remove yourself from the climate emergency group? I think. Lisa's gonna no. Yep, Lisa. Um, please, may I add myself with Max's permission to the unitary group? 
Um, and can I can I also add that we've we've had a, um, a, a, a talk amongst councillors about two possible new groups, which I'm going to advise that uh, that we that we don't add into this. But that's completely open for discussion with my fellow councillors. Um, things that we'd like to add include young people in education, and also um, participation and engagement. Um, Anybody have anything else to? Okay, thank you, Lisa. Yeah. I don't know if we wanted to talk about this now. I'm aware that Anne wasn't at the meeting last night, but we did talk about the reduced poverty group of whether we actually, at this moment in time, is that a functioning group and do we still need it? Okay, is that a discussion you want to have? At a Can I add that I, I don't think my fellow councillor suggests that we don't look at poverty and that that's not important to the agenda. Um, I just want that on record. Do you, okay, is that something that we just want to think about and then come back next time and, and do that? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think our, our work was very necessary we did a lot of stuff um with particularly with the cost of living crisis but i think it's turned into a a longer term working away closely in conjunction with fair Froome. and i am now a trustee of fair Froome. so we've got those strong links between what we're doing and, and what the council's doing um so it may well be that just our work with Fair Froome continues on that basis. I, I think it's probably wise to remember that that in the current strategy that that that, that is mid train and, and and due to end March next year, one one of the six programs in there is is about this and and this 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 advisory group is will report back on progress through the year on on the delivery of that. So it, it might be that the, the delivery of that part of the program, sorry, that part of the strategy is complete or will be complete soon. But uh, I think it would be worth just having the discussion around whether this uh, has relevance anymore when you look at the elements in the work program and, and whether they have been completed. <clears throat> yes, and I, and I think the general view was that they had, and that our role really was to kind of convene the different players to make sure that there weren't any kind of gaps in what they were doing, um, and to ensure that um, people in Froome had the relevant information that they needed. It was never really our role, I think, within the strategy to single-handedly alleviate poverty in the town. It was to, it was to create, it was to work with the groups who really hold that remit, and to kind of make sure that that was on the agendas of Mendip as Walls and Somerset and the various other agencies. So I think there is a general feeling that that work is really done um, and and you know it was always regarded I think within the strategy that there would be churn you know that new things work would be done completed and then we'd move on to the next thing rather than just to kind of continue with a set of themes that carry on forever so I think that was the general feeling last night is that really we've we have done this work and thank you to Anne and the other members of the group for doing it but it does feel like there's a lot of staff allocated to that there's a lot you know and there's a lot now going on in Unitree there's a lot emerging I think in education in the town that we probably need to grab hold so I think there was a general feeling that we would like to transition from one group, from that group to a set of new priorities, which we had identified previously. And, and as a group, when we first met, we talked about, at some point, talking about education. And I kind of think probably that time has come. Yeah, I think Paul would like to respond. I, I think that's, that's, that's a really reasonable. And, and as you'll see from the sort of the timetable, the next council meeting next month, it's re reviewing progress on this group so I, that's why i'm suggesting that actually next time maybe you look at all that see how you got on and whether or not that group has done its job or whether it needs to develop i think lisa and then anne please yeah no i've got i've got kate I'm, i just saw lisa's hand up first yeah uh just just again i just want to reiterate of course it's it's hugely valuable work and and thanks to anne and and everybody else who's been working on it um i I hear what you're saying, um, you know, reviewing it and seeing where, where it sits in terms of how much action we put into it at, at which time I think would be a good idea. 
and and of course always keeping in view that it might turn into a crisis again <laughs> in October, in which case we might have to do more. Um, so it's on our radar, it's always there, but not as a crisis at this mo moment. Okay, thanks, Anne. Kate? Yeah, really briefly. We'll bring the report next time. There are some ongoing actions that have come out of that that need to be considered because they're part of a, they're in train. So our refugee welcome hub, for example, sits underneath that. Um, so there's a number of things that we'll report back on. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there. What we recognised is, is that a gap in perhaps participation to support that um, next steps for that group. Thank you, Kate. I believe Tracy wants to make a comment. Um, if we're agreed on that, I just wanted to say that um, could I come off um, town football club because of um, clashes at home? Um, we've already got a team member um, and I would be um, interested if it's OK with the others in um, involving the unitary deal group, please. Lisa again, yeah, go on. Um, yeah, no. I'm going to ask to be taken off of the football as well, um, as I will be a director of the CBS. Okay, thank you. Fiona? Um, I'm just wondering if it wouldn't be a good idea if we sort of did a bit of a jig around of all the groups and everything and came back with a renewed thing next time. I think there's a couple of things that need working out. For instance, the um, uh, public transport bit of the strategy is in the climate and economic uh, climate and ecological emergency work program and obviously you're leading on that Philip very well Mr bus fantastic so I think there is something about what we do with the projects that are currently sort of sitting outside or slightly in and if the idea is to sort of bring everything into these um, six or seven advisory groups then I think we need to make sure that they are things are actually brought in the right people are in the room because otherwise we're going to end up sort of not being able to have certain conversations, if that makes sense. That's for us to have those conversations. Yeah. But, so on and then come back. Yeah. That's your proposal. Yeah. What do you want to do? So, so my beautifully neat table is now looks like a pizza. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure I've, I've got all the suggestions written down here, so I'm not going to bore you uh, reading them all out so that person's in this person's out um, but I'm pretty sure I've got them all what I'll do um, is, is is make those changes but suggest that you you, you you take them on trust that I've got them all written down correctly and then if, if we want to change it you, we can do that next time when when you sort of approve the minutes in the next meeting because otherwise you know, just just sort of for time's sake so the, the proposal Laura um, or the recommendation is is there and and the, if you can trust me at least until the minutes come out <laughs> proposed nick dove seconded anita all in favor thank you That's unanimous. Yeah. okay moving on uh item nine uh, decision to adopt the council's financial regulations sarah thank you very much so <clears throat> you can have your own mic now. So yeah, the financial regulations are reviewed annually and has been circulated prior to the meeting. There were just some minor amendments with one sentence on the report circulated. Um, that's item 8.7 in the policy. Um, an external payment batch is limited to 300,000 per day. Any higher amounts will require authorization by email from the council leader or mayor. That replaces the previous 150,000 limit over three days. It's out of date with the frequency of payments now required from the council. And the recommendation. Or any questions? Is it the ethical decision matrix included in this bit, or is that the next bit? Uh, it's included in the policy. It's at the end of it, yeah. Did so you... that's what we're discussing now. Can I just, I had a couple of comments on that. Um, my f Overall, I've just sort of reading it. I just realised it's all negative in terms of we won't have a negative impact on 
X, Y, Z. I just wonder whether we've ever looked at what our positive impact would be and whether there is a way in which we could look at whether we could positively, for example, um, you know, reduce inequality, not reduce inequality, but be more um, move towards equity, et cetera. So rather than it being all done negatively. And also, I just thought, will the decision have a negative economic impact on local people, whether we could also include well-being in that? So it's not just the economic impact. I'm really happy to review those with you and bring it back yeah. um, next month. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So if we accept them as they are for now and then review next yeah. month. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure there's a minute in there to, to, to Sarah and, and um, Fiona just to have, have a bring back a revised matrix. Okay, we're happy to accept, propose. Andy, seconded, Mel. Again. Which Andy? Which Andy? Sorry, Andy Jones. Andy Jones. That's unanimous. Um, item 10. So um, at May each year, the, uh, we circulate and report on the final accounts for the financial year end to March, the statutory process required to approve the accounts and the reserve balances commencing 1st of April. Um, the Annual Governance and Accountability Return Forms, which is the AGAR, um, required for smaller authorities to complete, were circulated to you with the report. Um, all thanks to Hannah Panisha for first-rate bookkeeping in the year, approved and commended by the internal auditors. Hannah has also drafted um, this year's AGAR for review and approval. Once councillors are satisfied they have no outstanding queries on the accounts, we obtain councillors' decision, council's decision to approve the AGAR for submission to the government appointed external auditors for smaller local authorities who are PKF Little John. The exercise of public rights, the first one this year is 5th of June to 14th of July, and that's when members of the public can make an appointment to come into the council and review any financial records. But uh, so following this meeting, the AGAR is approved by our councillors and we place it on the website and then um, the, the, uh, any member of the public can make an appointment. If you don't already know, earmarked reserves known as EMRs are ring-fenced funds for specific purposes, while the general reserve is available for unplanned um, or emergency expenditure. As the reports you've seen explain, the year ended with a net surplus arising primarily from staff costs, open spaces wow. expenditure, community development and grants. We also received extra unbudgeted income from town hall meeting room hire and from bank interest. Overall project costs were underspent, but the existing staff resource employed to its fullest capacity. The underspend offers a number of possibilities, but has already enabled the council to secure two land assets, Froom buying Broadway Community Gardens and securing the land at Badgers Hill, which is working towards the new Froom Town Community Benefit Society. The surplus will be carried forward for certain projects and also enable us to respond to new opportunities. We're proposing that moving 105k is approved for various earmarked reserves as shown in the circulated list, and that a further 164,000 is put into the new project's research and development EMR, which will be useful um, not only, but for looking at projects in the new unitary structure. The circulated balance sheet shows 479 in general reserves currently, although after deducting the 164,000 proposed and the 39 already approved for income subsidy this year, it would leave 276 in general reserves to start the 2023-24 year. This is 96k higher than the prudent general reserve figure of 180 in our financial regs, but as I've said before, this figure was set some years ago, and again I'm recommending we retain this higher level of general reserve. And finally, our savings for town hall roof works and play equipment, along with the investment into football ground, has the added benefit of enhanced, enhanced staff training and new <laughs> challenges for councillors. <laughs> Any questions? Andy and Fiona. Uh, first off, I wanted to thank Sarah for spending a useful half hour with a few of us yesterday going through some very detailed questions that would have bored this meeting to death while I get my head around how all this works. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I did have one particular point on the EMR 4790, which is the school crossings 
bucket. We have an ongoing underspend on that. Um, and we clearly have an ongoing need in town for some more support in that area. And I'm just wondering if we can do anything through some more publicity or working with the schools to try and drive up the, uh, the uptake of that reserve and spend it on helping the kids cross the road. We, we can definitely do that. Uh, the issue is there are, there are lots of vacant positions. Nobody wants to stand in the road and be hit by cars. Um, so, and that's that's the bottom line, is that they really, you know, that um, there have been a lot of incidents in frame where, where lollipop persons have been hit by vehicles, and yeah, so it's recruiting into the post, it's not through want of trying, but I'm sure we can do something. You're not selling it. I'm not selling it, am I? <laughs> but I'm being honest about it, and I think that's the, that's why those posts are there, the schools are trying quite hard. Okay, thanks. Fiona, then Max. Um, two, uh, one question, one point, I guess. Um, so the question is, the um, new projects budget is now looking quite exciting of £214,000. Can I just clarify where decisions are made about that being spent? Is it here at full council? Yes. yes. I think the unit, so, well, various aspects of the council can come up with ideas and put proposals together and bring it to council, but it would be councillors voting on it. Okay. And then the other one is actually something off the back of something Mel said, I remember a few months ago about the ERMs and how there is quite a lot in them now. And also some of the descriptions seem to sort of be related to projects quite a long time ago. And I just wonder whether a useful exercise would be to really go through and think, how can we spend this money this year if we want to? And if not, let's bring it to council obviously to make the decision to just clear it into either general reserves or new project um, etc um, obviously there are somewhere there are restrictions on how that money needs to be spent and I understand that but I just thought rather than it just sort of sitting there like let's see how can we spend it what ideas are and you could certainly make yeah. the first projects of the oversight committee to have a look at the EMRs that's a good idea yeah do it there let's, let's not forget as well that um Sarah has gone through them with a fine tooth comb already um, and, and I, we can test whether there's any flab in there but uh, they, they, they all have uses at the moment you can you can remove the use but they all have uses at the moment and that's why they, they, they stayed in but I, I think it's, Sarah's suggestion is quite good isn't it sort of the, the, the next oversight committee will be focusing on all things finance so this is a really good example Max so <clears throat> apologies to Sarah for not attending the meeting last night to ask what is probably a very dull question, but not to me anyway, because I kind of quite like IT solutions. EMR396, I think I remember this from last year um, as well. Um, so I'm slightly confused as to what the actual amount is. You've got 44K, then 66K needed. And I'm really sorry if I've missed this, but I'm not kind of quite sure what it's needed for. There is a massive stuff going on now in this space in the IT field and I don't really think a CRM is really where we should be headed there are a lot more exciting solutions so I would love to have that debate and, and, and kind of create a situation where we can have that conversation yeah, that's exactly the way it's going to go that this EMR has built up when a CRM was first suggested it may be that the CRM is now out of date particularly as find seems to have a home developing through Somerset Council data so it will be about new conversations and new ideas but the one thing I would say is that Freetown Council's software, how we use it inter internally, really needs a good um, external IT consultant to come in, do an audit, someone who isn't invested in bespoke designing a system for us, but an independent. So, I, yes, yeah, so I, and I can suggest someone who would do that very well. Great. Mel? Uh, just two, two points, really. Um, Underspends are better than overspends, but underspends are still unsatisfactory. So I would hope that during the next 12 months that we, that you, you, you give some stick to those people who are not spending the money uh, as finance director. Um, and I think that would be useful for all of us. Um, Fiona's stolen my question on EMRs. Uh, and finally, just on the general reserves, which we've talked about frequently, uh, I'm assuming it's still kept at 180,000 and the rise this year is just for this year, and then we'll have another discussion on what the appropriate figure is. 
because that's you'd like it reviewed in the financial regs from a <laughs> or you'd like well i'm not sure whether it's a review of the financial reg because the financial regs say it's 180 you've just upped it uh which is fine i mean i'm not against that but as you know i quite like to spend some money and i've got some good projects coming forward so there is some money this year then, <laughs> so anyway is it is it this is it just a one-off or are you going to raise it next year to a figure which is higher i guess i'm not raising the prudent reserve in the financial recs that's staying at 180 okay I'm saying what we have in the bank is 96k more than the 180 which does give us flexibility great thank you thanks mel any other points that's it. Thank you very much, Sarah. Very detailed, informative report, as always. Thank you very much. A lot of work gone into that. I beg your pardon. The most important thing about this meeting is that there are statutory forms that need signing in a particular order. Section one is to be signed by the. Yeah. 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 Hold on. Can we have a proposal for the recommendation, please? Sarah? Okay. Okay. Seconded by Lisa. All those in favour? So I missed who the proposal was. Proposal, Sarah. Seconded, Lisa. Great. And that looks unanimous. Even with the man. <laughs> so I, th I think while, while you two sign that, or I sign it, I think. What happens is we, I have to sign it with Philip on the first page and then the RFO signs it with Philip on the second page. That's why it needs to be done yeah, separately. Cool. Uh, and it needs to be a separate minute for the external auditors. So while I'm signing it, you can have the recommendation, the second recommendation up, which is up there. Okay, second recommendation. Can we have a proposal? Anne, seconded, Nick Dove. Anne and Nick. Ava. Should we assume that Mel is approving that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, Andy. Yes, unanimous. <laughs> thank you. Um, that's, you that, that's not for minusing this, but that one. Uh, there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. And, uh, and then the final three. Final three you need to read this out because the TV's gone blank for some reason. The final three on this agenda. Right? Yeah, the final three recommendations on the agenda are. I can't see them. I, don't, I, I have to read them out. The final three there. Three plus three, four and five. Uh, the difference to that one. No, they're not. It's approved. Oh, that's four, five, and six. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Four, uh, approve and exercise the public rights dates for 2023. Five, approve the revised earmark reserves for the start of the financial year. Six, note the amount in the general reserve at the start of the financial year. Proposer, please. Andy Jones, seconder, Andy Rintmore. And that's unanimous as well. Thank you, that's yours. Okay, and item 11 on the agenda is update on progress in the planning section of the work programme. And over to Jane, please. Thank you, Philip. I'll just check that you can all hear me. You can't hear me. Thought that might happen. Now can you hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so yes, uh, as introduced, uh, it's just an update on the Improve Planning and Deliver Affordable Housing Programme in the Council Plan and the Work Programme. Um, that's not the slide I was expecting. <laughs> that's the slide I was expecting. Uh, yes, so... Um, as you can see, uh, every project is currently green, so on track and ongoing. I'm happy to talk you through each of the sections or just leave you to ask questions. We've got till nine, so, you know. 
yeah. Any preference? Would you like me to go through each one or? No. Okay. Any questions? Andy. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Can I suggest that it's worth uh, expanding a little bit more on the second one, particularly the uh, what an SPD does for everybody's benefit and uh, what steps we're taking to achieve that? Yeah, so uh, supplementary planning document. Um, you may all be familiar with the existing document that we have on sustainability, which we have adopted as a council. Um, that means that we as a council uh, promote it to developers, applicants, but it's not adopted by Somerset Council as the local planning authority, so it doesn't carry weight in that respect. Um, they have subsequently done their own sustainability SPD. Um, what we're looking at here is, first of all, putting together our own supplementary planning document that, was, that sets out why we want to see 40% affordable housing as our local policy, which will be over and above the 30% affordable housing, which is the local plan policy. One reason for doing that is because we know that the local plan is not going to be reviewed and updated for three possibly five years um, and we, we can't wait we, we can't go another five years with only getting 30 percent of affordable housing from planning developments that's true yes in in some cases we don't get 30 percent um, however it will be our own local supplementary planning document um, and again it won't be enforceable by Somerset as the local planning authority. However, the hope is that in the same way that we did with our sustainability document, um, it might encourage Somerset, um, hopefully working with the Somerset councillors to bring forward their own supplementary planning document in advance of a local plan being in place so that we don't lose another potentially five years of getting a reduced amount a reduced percentage of affordable housing. Um, so yes, we're currently working on that and we're using the basis of um, wells because they are an exception in the current local plan and they do get 40% affordable housing. There was a reason for that. It's not straightforward. It's a, it's a lot of research and reading, but hopefully if we can demonstrate that Froome is now in the position that wells were in um, when they were deemed to need 40% affordable housing, then I'm, I'm hopeful that we can, you know, that's enough evidence to, to enable that to happen. Thank you. Next, then Fiona. Hi. Um, can I ask, please, that uh, work on the neighbourhood plan? Uh, links up with other engagement work. There's a lot of, um, a lot of the, the, the work that the councillors are doing that, that's looking into more engagement and participation and I just want to um, ensure that it's going to be linked up. Absolutely yes it is something that we've been dis discussing as, as um, the, the management group to, to how we can achieve that because we're also very conscious of the fact that there's a lot of engagement going on about different things people get fed up with hearing from us about this and that so yes we are looking how we can bring that all together. Okay, thank you. Um, so another Nick. Um, I just first of all, I just want to back up what Helen Kay said earlier um, about how that you are that there is a difference in terms of the developments that are now coming forward. Um, going off the last planning meeting, the two developments we looked at: the David Wilson Homes land at Little Keyford, and then the North Parade. I mean, they are genuinely a massive improvement on what I think has been before with solar panels, heat pumps loads of things it is i think testament to Stephen, the earlier planning committee and also obviously helen and the rest of the planning councillors at mendip and then and now somerset and i think it's one of the things i'm finding a bit frustrating is is not all development is the same and 
that doesn't seem to be getting through as a message that there seems to be, you know, I sort of waded into Facebook the other day um, because, it, you know, it, some developments are genuinely like that one at North Parade. I think we've, we've supported it, so I can say this, right? Yeah, is genuinely really good and exciting. And I don't know how we get that out as a message that, that there is a difference in, in, you know, in a three and four bedroom home estate with, you know, with gas boilers and some of the other developments. And it's really important that we are able to support some of the developments that are coming forward. Um, and I don't know whether there is something to do with that. And then also my bugbear that I talk about that is that the planning rules and regulations and everything are really opaque and how you understand the planning process, but whether there is a bit of comms that we could do around that. And then also something that I don't know I don't know how we do it but that is about recognizing that not all developments are the same and that there are some sites that are actually quite good for development and also there are some developments that are genuinely quite exciting coming through because um, it just seems that there is a weariness that I see online of just sort of like oh not another development not another you know and it's not a show that's of not weariness of yes developments coming. I'm sure you do <laughs> yeah no absolutely we are, we are looking at um what, what we can what we will put out and say about the uh, North Parade development um, and yeah absolutely I mean we did the so we did similar with Cherry Grove um, when we supported that so yeah absolutely we'll look at that okay thank you uh, Nick then Mel yeah I mean I just to come back on that and, and I hope that Helen or Adam anyone else involved in this work doesn't see I wasn't having a personal attack at yourselves I do understand how difficult it is having been a um, town councillor for a few years, how difficult it is to make things happen, influence things. It's a general frustration with how things play out. And, um, you know, having been in a development project myself in another county where they, the approach from the planning authority there was far stricter and really, you know, they really um, forced our hand in terms of what we could do. Um, it feels that we feel a bit softer. And yeah, you know, and I appreciate that's not any single person's role. It's a, you know, it's a kind of local plan. Uh, my question was though about um, point three. Um, I seem to find myself at meetings always being a, a fairly solitary voice complaining about um, what some people describe as nimbyism in a way that they seem to be quite pleased about. Um, but how are we going to bring together this broad cross section? Because whenever I see meetings about housing developments, they are populated by people my age and older who all own their own properties generally as a bit of a bit of an exaggeration there are some who don't um and how do we how do we actually engage with people who really are those who are sleeping on other people's sofas and so on it's a very good question um we actually have a meeting with the community land trust tomorrow morning to talk in more detail about that meeting how we get those invites out how we reach out to the people that we don't usually hear from um and yes yeah, so i can update you on that afterwards thanks nick mel just a quick point on the neighborhood plan i was heavily involved in the first neighborhood plan as jen knows <laughs> and it was pain uh, it was it was a long-term process very difficult to do uh, and then most of it was scrubbed uh, that all the interesting bits were taken out a new neighborhood plan would have uh, even less possibilities around it because uh, you know, the, we're, 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 we've, we've developed a lot of land and there's not much land left now within the perimeter of Froome. So the real gain would be to work with the, the, the villagers that are probably going to take most of the development. Uh, and so just doing another neighborhood plan seems to me to be, unless it's quick and dirty, uh, it seems to me it might be a waste of time and a long-term process. Steve and I have talked about this, so I'm not talking completely out of turn. Uh, so let's be aware of that. It could eat up a lot of resources for not much gain in the end. So we might need to think about how we could develop a new approach to that. Max? So I just want to support that really. Uh, I think, um, and I think people who attended the recent local community network meeting, which had not all, but quite a number of the surrounding villages uh, involved in it. So I think both from the point of view of planning, neighborhood plans, transport, and all of those sorts of things, we had to start thinking bigger than Froome. 
Um, and I kind of think that's right in relation to that to that plan. I think it's that right right in relation to a number of things as well, really. So just want to support that direction. Thank you. I mean, certainly the transport plan. Um, yes, in, in including the villages. I think um, without wanting to be too technical, a, a neighbourhood plan is defined by its boundary, um, which is normally a parish boundary. Um, so yes, we would have to redefine a boundary, which would mean having to agree that with the other relevant parishes. So um, absolutely something that we can talk about. Although I, I, you know, I would say if, we, if you're looking at our neighbourhood plan as it is, it is out of date. Um, and the, some of the key things that it already covers, um, if an application went to appeal, it could be argued by the appellants that it hasn't been updated and therefore the things that we think we've got covered aren't covered. So I, I, I would still say there is an importance to updating that plan, but totally um, hear what you're saying about working with the parishes. Thank you. Um, Helen and then Steve. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jane will know that I asked you about two years ago, could we update the neighbourhood plan, please, and include, because we were talking about, you were doing, from Town Council was leading a consultation on Selwood Garden community, as it's now called. And Jane said, no, we couldn't, because the boundary is what's known as the lane with no name, I think, for Froome. Yeah. And um, so on and an online meeting, which was attended by at least one person from Selwood Parish Council, I said, could we get together, this is before the LCNs are on the table, with the surrounding parishes and come up with a new growth plan for Froome? And there was pretty much silence from everybody who didn't particularly want to work together in that way. When I then said, can we look at transport implications, there was a very positive response from people wanting to work together. So so as part of the sustainable transport plan came out of the concerns about the the the, the town growing selwood garden uh, development um in terms of making things happen going forward you i think you mentioned jane about dpds or someone mentioned maybe adam earlier that we there was a discussion this morning about a dpd which i think can be developed ahead of the local plan and you just said you know if you do something about affordable housing now that that could be then something that somerset council takes up i would be very supportive of that if if i could get it into a well i think it's a development plan document which can stand stand alone separately from um, an old local plan or a new local plan or a local plan in development so i mean i would be very supportive to try to do that alongside the one that was mentioned this morning which was about a climate um bringing a climate emergency into uh, and sustainable construction into our uh, coming local plan going forward um but also i'm just even wondering if we can think even bigger and get a dpd about how Froome is going to grow going forward that could, the lcn could be a forum where we discuss those issues or it could also be the Froome town council planning committee and invite all the parishes in but i mean i think that would that's also something i'm just just throwing it out there I hadn't occurred to me before that, that that could also be a DPD because we really do need to have that discussion and I'm a bit fed up with having all the developments as I put in my column this this week like um, lots of people are going to end up fighting different parts of town saying oh no we don't want the development here it's got to be over there we've got to actually have a group discussion about it so I think you're doing the right thing but how can we actually get that so it's enforced and that the planning authorities take note of it no I Thank you for that offer, Helen. I, I agree and happy to work with whoever to make that happen, including parishes if necessary. So thank you. Okay, I'll take the last point from Steve, please, on this um, one. Thanks, sir. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thank, um, I just want to, um, Mel's comment, absolutely, totally agree um, with him. If we do update the neighbourhood plan, it's, it's, it's got to make sense. It's, it's got to be good value for money. Um, I think just um, the, the thing on the, the that sort of um, lit the light bulb for me was when the uh, Marston Lane appeal that Jane and I attended most of, um, and the report on that, the uh, government inspector gave significant weight to the fact that at that point we did have a valid neighbourhood plan. And I think if we didn't have a valid neighbourhood plan, that would have probably gone through. Um, so I think that's one of, the, one of the reasons why we need to look into it. I'm not saying we need to do it. I think we need to look into it 
find out what benefit it's going to give us, um, what the cost implications are, if we can link it in with other things that we want to do around the town. And um, but that's that's a bit of work that I think we need to take away and um, bring back to councillors in a in a month or two. Great, right, thanks, Steve. That's it. Thank you very much, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. Um, I'd just like to say that the uh, I have to say the next meeting will be on Wednesday, the fourteenth of June. Uh, I'd like to say, <laughs> go on. Okay, I was just going to say, I'd like to say thank you all for attending. I'd like to thank Jill and Sue for attending and uh, a very special Mrs. Merrill that attended earlier on, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, thank you to Ian. For, for turning up, you're most welcome, and hopefully we'll see you at more meetings. Uh, thank you to all the uh, contributions, both in the room and online, and comments that were made. Thank you to fellow councillors, and um, Fiona's going to say something in a minute. And thank you for Karin for coming. And uh, she only wants a lift home, that's why she's, she's been to a party. And um, thank you to Paul and Laura for all the support they gave me today. Now Lisa wants to say something, and then I know Fiona wants to say something. Um, I just like to say on behalf of all of the if councillors, thank you to our outgoing leader, Anita. Thank you for everything this year. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic. And thank you also to Max, who uh, was deputy last year and remains deputy this year. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> and I think Fiona wants to say something. Thanks very much and have a pleasant evening. Thank you.